everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I tend to project pretty well, but if I'm not, like folks in the back, just give me a little wave and I'll, I'll project a little bit louder. Um, you know, it's always an honor to do these talks. Thank you so much, Piero, for my second invite back to the laser um, talks. Uh, I am the program manager for the Pyrenean Artists in Residence program. Um, but like all good talks, they always start with a video. So um, I'm going to take give you a video of my own and um, set the mood. <laughs> <laughs> something from, from an idea to a physical form is, is one of the most fascinating moments uh, in the world that we get to live in. And so I'm going to take you through what it feels like to be uh, part of the Artist in Residence program at Pier 9. So um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Vanessa Sigurdsson and I come from a sort of a fabrication background. And when I uh, moved to San Francisco, I actually came to understand what an Artist in Residence program is. Um, I uh, started working for a company called Autodesk. I'm sure quite a few of you have heard of the company Autodesk. Raise your hand if you haven't. Oh, cool. Okay, so Autodesk is a design software company. We make design tools for a variety of industries, architecture, engineering, product design. Um, Autodesk tools have been used to design the things that you drive, the buildings that you live in, uh, the chairs that you sit on, and even like the movies that you've watched. Um, there's over 150 different tools that Autodesk makes. Um, one of the most well-known tools is probably AutoCAD, um, but there's really a whole host of other tools. And um, the company's been around for about 30 years, and at this point, uh, we've gotten really good at helping people design beautiful things behind the screen, but where we're trying to get to is to help people bring those things into the real world. So there's been a huge push in the company to sort of facilitate the fabrication process, the making process, and that's uh, why the Artist in Residence program plays a very small part in that, um, but it's a part that I really, really enjoy. So, um, Pier 9 itself uh, is a space, it's a location, right? It's, it's, a, it's a vessel, and it's a vessel for um, minds and creatives to come together. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, we're, we're on the waterfront, we're super lucky um, to have this location. Um, it's a 35,000 square foot workshop and office environment. Um, it houses multiple teams, um, one of which is Instructables, and Instructables is an online how-to company. Um, I'll get into Instructables in just a little bit. Um, one of the big users of our workshop is uh, the top man himself. This is Carl Bass. He's the CEO of Autodesk, and he comes in and uses our workshop to build stuff. This is his electric go-kart, um, and uh, last week he brought his son in to build as well, and so it's really nice to have everybody from uh, the CEO all the way down to anybody that's developing work or in marketing or in finance or any part of the company really have access to our workshop in order to create and explore ways of making things. Um, why have a workshop in a company? Well, for us, it's, it's a perfect, um, I call it like the perfect storm because uh, since we create tools to help people design stuff 
and we want to create tools that help people make stuff, we need to know how to make stuff as well. So that's why we have this workshop. The workshop itself um, has a, a wood shop, it has a metal shop, um, it has an electronics lab, and it also has a, a CNC lab. Um, CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control, which is just a bunch of big words next to each other. They're really these big machines that um, take a digital design and, and it's actually an artist today um, said that they're pretty much a, a, a massive machine that can move around like an elegant cat that has a knife on the end. Um, so it can be used to sculpt things, cut things, cut materials. Your car rims have been machined on a CNC machine. Um, so we have uh, sort of production quality CNC machines for folks to use. Um, laser cutting uh, is something that we also provide and of course, the buzzword, I don't know if it's still a buzzword actually, but 3D printing. Uh, we do a lot of 3D printing at Pier 9. Um, textiles is also a very much big part of our workshop. We really believe that you can you know, machine a really beautiful chair, but you still need the cushion to sit on. So you want to have a textiles area to do stuff. Also, the world of wearables is, is a big space right now, and so we do a lot of work in the textiles area. And one of my favorite rooms is the test kitchen. Um, it's a space for us to cook together, to experiment with food, um, food projects. Uh, so I'll get back to Instructables at this point. Um, this whole kind of space actually spun out from an acquisition that Autodesk did back in 2012. Uh, they purchased Instructables, which is an online DIY-based how-to website. Users upload their own projects, and it's everything from how to make a pumpkin pie to how to make a jet engine. Um, so a lot of the projects on Instructables are food-based stuff. Um, when Autodesk acquired the company, they thought, okay, well, let's build out this workshop so that we can make stuff. And that kind of spiraled out of control and ended up being that 35,000 square foot <laughs> workshop that you just saw. Um, so they use the workshop a lot. Um, also, before they were acquired, they had a lot of interns come in and use their, their small workshop at the time. And they thought, okay, well, we want to keep that alive, keep that going. But in a large corporation, you can't call them interns. So we decided to start up the Artists in Residence program. So um, now, I told you about the vessel that holds everything. But what really makes Pier 9 special is the community. It's the people that are there. And this is just a small group of that community um, on a day where we're being our full selves. Um, and it's something that we really try to promote in our space. Every uh, first Tuesday of the month is called Tremendous Tuesday. And this is one of those days where you're encouraged to come in wearing all the things that you, you know, hide in the back of your closet but just can't give up. So uh, everybody comes in dressed up doing their thing. Um, so I'll jump over now to the residency program itself because that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, as Piero mentioned earlier, we've worked with over 160 creatives. Um, I like to sort of switch the vocabulary here a little bit and just mention that um, by creatives, uh, we actually work with artists, but we also work with designers, fashion folks, architects, uh, engineers, um, culinary technologists. Uh, what makes our space really unique is the fact that we bring together all these multidisciplinary backgrounds and we shove them all into this vessel and we shake it around and we ask them all to sort of share ideas and, and connect. So um, this is a, a snapshot from, uh, <laughs> from a moment in time when all the artists are there kind of collaborating. I'm just going to kind of call out a, a friend here. That back there is Gabe Caprillion, who's sitting right there. Um, I threw this picture in just for you, Gabe. Um, <laughs> so I like to think of um, what we do as sort of this intersection between art, technology, science, and also manufacturing. We really span this, um, this, this kind of intersection between all of those things. Who do we look for when we um, invite artists to join us? Uh, it's a question I get a lot, and I think that that um, is a very hard question to answer. Uh, obviously, anybody who's creative you know, should think about one day applying to the residency program. Um, that said, we do bring on folks that have begun to develop a vocabulary around the tools that we have and are starting to ask questions about how we can push those tools into new spaces or how we can use them in compelling and interesting ways. And I want to also say that sometimes those tools are, are traditional tools and sometimes they're, they're digital tools. And we really believe that there's a magical blend that happens when you combine traditional tools and, and digital tools. All right, so um, 
A lot of artists in residence programs provide time and space for folks to come up with new ideas, and I think that's a really beautiful thing. Um, in San Francisco, there is no such thing as space, um, and our residencies last about four months long. Um, but what we provide is we provide access to these sort of advanced tools that are typically out of reach. And um, what, what we really enjoy is giving folks actual hands-on experience with these tools. So here you see um, one of our artists in residence, Jeremy Magner, uh, just like on his first project, he like bit off a really huge thing. So he's standing there with like his hand on the switch, just ready to turn this thing off in case it goes haywire on him. Um, this is a picture of a couple cohorts ago on, on cohorts. Well, actually, let me back up onto that. Uh, we bring on two groups a year. Each group is about 16 uh, individuals. So we call each group a cohort. And um, some just things you should know about the residency program, they, we provide $8,000 stipend to cover the four months. We cover project budget uh, above that. Um, we provide access to all the tools. They can uh, have any Autodesk software they want. And I think the most unique part about our program is that the artists own everything that they create. We want them to walk away owning what they, what they worked on. So if it ends up being a, our piece that they can sell or a project that they can try to start a new business on, that would make us really, really happy. Um, another thing they, they uh, leverage quite a bit when they come to um, our workshop is the technical expertise. So having folks help them understand how to use these tools is, is really important. We have an entire curriculum of classes that go along with all the tools. And uh, the artists can come in, sign up for whatever class they want, get uh, hands-on experience, get some tips, um, figure it out along the way. And um, kind of like the talk before us, it's sort of like that, you know, doing it yourself ingrains that information into your brain. Um, so sometimes it's also uh, really awesome when you see people converse and share ideas and cross-pollinate ideas. So this is a group of artists talking about 3D printing and kind of trying to push the limits of what they, their understanding is of the tool and how they can do new things with, with the technology. Um, so when artists come, you know, we do a lot of things in the program. We try to celebrate the different practices that we have. Um, we push them to explore new spaces that they're not used to exploring. And what's most important, I think, is asking them to lean into their practice, asking them to take these tools and see how if they can apply it to the practice that they already have. Um, and this is when great things happen. So this is our uh, artist in residence, Sewe, who's standing there at a CNC machine, and he's trying to figure out how he can design better products. He's a product designer. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, there's something really amazing that happens when folks have like hands-on access to these tools. Um, you really learn what can and cannot be made, but there's even more to understanding like how your brain works when you're actually machining things versus sitting behind a computer and just sort of clicking away at things. Um, a lot of artists nowadays come from like this digital space um, to take them into the physical world. It's a whole different set of tool sets that you have to de develop. Um, on, the, on the screen, if you're kind of drawing or modeling something and you need to smooth it out, it's usually like a quick uh, couple buttons or if something went wrong, you can undo that, that thing that went wrong. In the real world, those things don't quite happen. To smooth something out can be hours upon hours of sanding. And so trying to think ahead um, about how materiality is or, or how things come together or how they assemble, um, those are all moments that we kind of explore at a pretty deep level. So that's kind of all the, the nuts and bolts about the program. Um, I don't think I missed anything super important about that, but I'm going to take you through more exciting stuff here where I'm going to show you some of my favorite projects. So um, first up here is a project by Anouk Repret. Um, this is a project where Anouk water jet cut this dress out of steel so that ultimately she could stand between two Tesla coils and uh, arc about two million volts worth of electricity um, through her dress. Um, Anu comes from a fashion background and was pairing up with a, with a couple performers at Maker Fair and it was pretty scary when she finally did this. Um, my turn worked out super well. <laughs> She's alive, guys. She's alive. <laughs> The next project uh, is by uh, Madeline Gannon, and Madeline is a, you know, an interaction designer, um, but she works a lot with robots, and uh, I think that robots are kind of taking over the, the 3D printing buzz, you know, now it's all about robots, 
And um, what you're seeing here is an industrial arm, an industrial robotic arm. These are things that are normally used to assemble cars or um, maneuver really, really heavy things around. And they're normally put behind a cage where humans can't come into close interaction with them. So Madeline's been exploring ways in which she can be closer to this equipment, um, work together with it, and have it follow her around. And there's a ton of different applications that will ultimately come from this. Um, so uh, this was a really fun project to get access to these tools so that she could kind of um, get really, really close. Our, our legal team does not like it when people do that. So. <laughs> um, this project over here, I'm wondering if anybody is here from Berkeley and recognizes this project? Oh, okay, cool. Um, this was a project done by a gentleman by the name of Ricardo Lamanga, who was here from Berlin, um, but uh, he wanted to develop a pavilion. He's an architect, and he wanted to exploit um, materials, exploit the inherent properties of materials. So he designed this very low-cost, lightweight pavilion structure um, where each one of those panels, I think there's over 500 panels in this piece, are all completely unique, and he had to sort of, um, when he cut them, had to label each one so that he knew exactly how they were going to go together. Um, this was at a show, so at the end of the residency, we do sort of a showcase, and it's also open to the public. Um, if you visit our website, you'll find out when the next one is, which will be in November, actually, beginning of December. Um, this project also made a debut here at uh, Berkeley during, uh, I think it was late last year, uh, during one of the architecture shows that um, you guys had. Um, this project over here is one of my personal favorites as well. Morishin Alahari is a new media artist who um, comes from Iran. And during her residency, uh, ISIS was sort of destroying a lot of uh, sculptures um, in Iran. And so she was really taken back by that process and was sort of like, how can I leverage my residency to bring awareness to these things? So what she did was she um, reached out to like an army of 3D modelers and had them look at pictures and recreate those sculptures and so that she could 3D print them. Beyond that, though, she found that it was really hard to find information about these sculptures. And now that they're destroyed, how are future generations ever going to understand what came before them? So um, she captured all that information into a USB stick, and that USB stick is implanted on the inside of the sculpture. So there's more than art in pavilions. Sometimes we can also help people. And that is a moment where I really, really enjoy. Uh, Kobe Unger, one of our artists in residence, uh, worked with this lovely gentleman by the name of Aiden. And they together designed this um, amazing, very basic prosthetic arm. It's a low cost prosthetic arm that hopefully anybody can create if they have a MakerBot 3D printer. That was part of the, the plan. Um, and what Kobe really wanted to do is it wasn't about giving Aiden, you know, a better prosthetic arm than the things that were already out there. He wanted to give Aiden sort of a makeover from the inside and give Aiden this, the ability to feel like a superhero. So Aiden wanted the ability to be able to play with his uh, Legos, just like his brothers and sisters did. And so um, Kobe created this arm. There's various other attachments that he can use. And uh, there's a violin, there's a fork, there's a bike riding um, attachment. So that, that project was really nice. Now, my last project that I'm going to talk about here, um, I'm right on time, this is awesome, um, is uh, this project that just actually wrapped up last, um, last May. Um, these are two artists from France. This is Joan and Pierre. And uh, these two guys actually, before they joined us, hacked a MakerBot to be a tattoo machine. But when they came to Pier 9, they really wanted to sort of create this you know, absurd um, project where they wanted to take those massive industrial robot arms that I told you about before and use that to tattoo. So um, we're very excited to say that we, that A, they didn't die, but <laughs> there's, a, there's a theme going on here. Um, but B, uh, this is the world's first ever tattoo created by an industrial robotic arm. So um, the whole point here is not to take away uh, work from, from tattoo artists. We're, we're not trying to do that. Um, we're actually trying to explore ways in which art can be done using different tools. And, and of course, uh, we're not saying that tattoo artists should go out there and buy an industrial robot arm anytime soon. Um, but perhaps there's, there's other tools that we can use to enhance the craft, and that's the space we really like to be in. So as I wrap up here, um, I want to just bring awareness to the amazing people that you know, help facilitate the programs. So we have a Pier 9 with multiple programs running all the time, not just the Artists in Residence program. And this is just a snippet of the community that works really, really hard to make that happen. And uh, last but not least, um, what are some of the values that we hold dear and near, near and dear to our heart? Um, it's A, a willingness to discover. Um, 
the freedom to explore and uh, be the belief that anything is absolutely possible. So thank you so much. One last uh, plug here is um, that uh, we have a um, deadline coming up for the spring 2017 cohort. So please pass the word on to the creatives that you know, the talented creatives that you know, to go to our website and apply to the residency program. Um, we'd love to see that. Thank you so much.